And hello, everyone. Whoa, I'm in a weird place here. <laughs> We're having so much fun here at Optic. I'm David Brommer. I am your host and your MC, and uh, I'm living in a pretty weird world right now. <laughs> okay, so welcome to Optic. Thank you, everyone, for coming. I want to just give a couple pieces of important updates and information out for everybody. First off, the Optic Challenge contest is now open. I know you've been following the Optic dispatches and our updates, but the contest is open. We've got right now 11 categories listed. I do believe we're going to be having a 12th category added soon, but take a look at those categories. Subject uh, one, submit one image each into those categories. Uh, you can enter as many categories as you want, but you can only put one image. It's free to enter, and right now, Drum roll, please. We are at over $20,000 in prizes out of those categories. That's pretty amazing. So definitely check that out. Um, we've already got a number of entrants in. Keep putting your entries in there. You got to be in it to win it. And did I mention it's free to enter? Okay, another big deal I got for you guys is next week, we are doing two photo walks. So for those of you that can get to New York City, on Tuesday, we're doing a photo walk in Coney Island with Sony. And on Thursday, we're doing a Washington Square Park, one of my favorite places in New York City, a photo walk there with Canon. Uh, the Canon one's gonna have, a, uh, it's gonna have Eric Stoner and we got a couple of other photographers. Uh, the Coney Island one is going to have uh, other photographer stations. It's a great place to go photograph. So you definitely wanna go check that out. Okay, so, um, you're all here for a pretty amazing webinar. I'm very excited today to uh, to talk to you and present this webinar with you. This is the first webinar of Optic, and it is sponsored by Nikon, and they have a Nikon ambassador, Joey Terrell, coming in. Just want to talk to you guys quickly about Nikon. Um, I collect cameras, as some of you know. I just added to my collection a Nikon F4. This is a film camera, and just showing you just how amazing Nikon was innovating throughout the years. And this camera being a film camera, I want you just to listen to this for a second. Ooh, such a cool analog camera with the MF21 back on the back. It's a piece of history because Nikon has been around since the 1930s and we've been shooting with Nikon cameras since the 40s and 50s. And they're just an amazing company with innovative products. So we have today an amazing photographer, Joey Terrell. Now, Joey is unlike your standard optic photographer in that he has started in magazine, editorial, newspaper photography, advertising photography, and he is a photographer's photographer. He really knows the craft and the technical to pull off amazing shots. So when we looked at his amazing uh, advertising portrait photography and whatnot, kind of said, you know, optic is the outdoor photography. And he was like, David, personal project and some amazing stuff. I love shooting macro and I love just talking about photography and our time setting up these classes with Joey. Uh, he's infected me as well. He's got me very enthusiastic about photography, which is inspiration is what Optic is all about. Joey is also going to be speaking on the main stage on July 11th at Optic. So this is the webinar with Joey, Tr Joey Terrell. Joey, welcome to Optic, the Optic stages in the webinars. Thanks, Dave. I really appreciate the nice introduction. And, uh, you know, thanks for having me. And thank you all for joining us today. It's, uh, it's great to have you all here. All right. So this is being recorded. So if anyone misses anything, you'll be able to watch this and uh, watch this. Also, feel free to uh, send your questions, drop them into the Q&A, drop them into the YouTube chat, and uh, we'll try to get uh, your questions answered. Okay, take it away, Joey. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Uh, everyone, I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully everybody sees that. So what I want to talk to you today is about, like David said, my personal project. It's something that I've, I've really enjoyed doing my whole life. Um, making pictures of macro is just, I don't know, it's one of those things. And particularly when COVID hit, it became something for me that was, I don't know, what else are we going to do? It's hard to get around the world when, when we've got a pandemic on. So I really dug into 
into macro during COVID. And I started doing all kinds of interesting things that pulled upon um, stuff I had done in my past. And like I say, macro has always been consuming to me. I mean, whether it was working with oil droplets floating in water, which is what you're looking at here, or the intricacies of a colorful flower like this. Sometimes it's going down to the local store and picking up a box of colored pencils and an interesting background. You know, you can, you can have a lot of fun. And again, this is one of those things that happens. You don't have to even leave your house. Um, so, you know, for those of you that live in an area where, you know, there's snow and rain and stuff, and I, I would be the first to tell you, I'm the type of person that, man, if, it, if there's a droplet of rain, I'm not going outside. I know there are a lot of great photographers that I admire. And they're the kinds of people that I, you know, I wish I could become that when it's raining, that's when they're out with the cameras. But for me, uh, I'm, I'm kind of a wimp. So, you know, I like finding stuff like this, like an old gadget in my kitchen drawer. This is a, uh, like a cocktail strainer. Sometimes just a feather you find, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you can pick one up online or something you find in the yard. Um, it's just fun to make detail pictures of things like this. And then there's a whole other realm for me of macro photography, um, the magnifying possibilities of water droplets on glass. I mean, it's just something that uh, the possibilities never really seem to end. But you know, for me, that's kind of just the beginning of the story. For me, more than anything else, light uh, is, is what photography is. In fact, the word photography literally means drawing with light. And it's been, for me, it's a thread that runs through every photograph I've ever made, especially macro work. As Dave said, I discovered the power of light to shape a photograph when I was starting out as a photographer for the LA Times. And I learned early that light could turn an ordinary news scene into something really graphic and, and arguably beautiful. I mean, even a fire can begin, kind of become something interesting. When I moved into commercial work photographing architecture, it was light that really revealed the shapes and the textures of buildings. And while I was fo photographing golf courses around the world, light made the undulations and obstacles of a course come to life. I mean, without the light, there's just no picture here. Now, most of my career, I've spent photographing people. And when I was photographing Deontay Wilder here, who's the at one point was the heavyweight champion of the world, it was the light I constructed that shaped him. And so that to me is the part of light that's the most fun is taking light that isn't or taking us uh, an environment and creating something with light. And, you know, even shooting someone like Derek Jeter, it's the same things. I mean, what got him into the 3000 hit club are those eyes, his ability to see a baseball. And so it's something with light I can bring out. During a studio session with someone like Justin Bieber, it's, it's the light that reveals his vulnerability as it is in an outdoor setting with someone like Ariana Grande. It's the soft light of an overhead silk that creates the mood, really. And even traveling halfway around the world, which I love to do, but haven't been able to do much lately, it's the rays of light that sets the tone for a photograph. And of course, even for a product photograph, light is a critical part of it. But it's macro photography that combines every illuminating quality that light provides. The beautiful highlights and shadows, the subtle tones and hues, and the shapes and the textures, that's something only light can express. And that's why I light, love light as much as I do. So as I said, you know, when COVID hit, I, I really started exploring drawers and cabinets around the house and, you know, even the garage. And, and I found some interesting macro subjects. You know, like I said earlier, when it's 10 below zero or 110 in the shade, or, you know, like with COVID, if you are prevented from venturing too far from home, you know, finding things around the house is really all you really can do. But um, you, can, you, can, you can create some fascinating results. This is a, um, a coffee filter. And I would bet if I were to ask, you know, what you think this is, I, I doubt few people would get it. It's the inside of a, of a dryer hose, you know, like what you would connect to your washer and dryer. 
And this is a, uh, um, a, like a colander, a fine strainer. But with the addition of some light and some color and using the f-stop on your lens to put focus where you want it and create those out of focus areas that make a photograph interesting sometimes, um, you can have a lot of fun. Even something like this, which is a kitchen whisk, um, it's the same kind of thing. I mean, I'm, I chose an f-stop that was very, very shallow, or, or I'm sorry, um, you know, a, a, I think I was probably at, at two, eight or four here. And the idea is, is I only wanted the tips at one point to be sharp and I wanted everything else to be soft and it almost creates movement. But this is not a complicated picture to make. It's just, you know, finding something in your kitchen drawer and creating a photograph with it. If you've, you know, pretty much done any kind of cooking, you probably recognize this as, you know, the spout of a mixing glass. But there, unless you tip something like this toward the light and have a really good look at, at how it's constructed, you miss the lines that are inherent in the glass. But if you light it in such a way where you can see them, it makes for kind of a cool abstract dark field, they call this dark field photography kind of photograph. At the other end of the spectrum, you know, a very small source uh, light source, very much like the sun. You know how a sun, the sun creates very strong shadows. The way you achieve something like this is the same way with a very, very small source. So like a speed light 30 or 40 feet away will create a shadow like this. But it just, the point is, is that there are things right around us all the time that you can turn into a photograph that on first blush don't really seem like they might be a photograph. But um, I have found that if you spend enough time with a subject, you'll find a photograph in it. And I think, and I say this all the time, I think that a lot of what all of us do as photographers, we quit too early. Like we look around and if we don't see something that's painfully obvious as a photograph, um, we stop. And, and instead, what we should do is look at, a, at, a, at something like this and say, how do I make a photograph of it that doesn't look like a, a, a product photograph? Now, I, I mentioned um, at, or I, I, I'm sorry, when we, before we joined, we were talking about the picture that was behind David. And this is the same subject that was behind him. It's just illuminated differently. What this is, is it's a silicone trivet. And it's the kind of thing you would use in the kitchen, you know, put on the counter to protect the counter from a hot pan. And I, it's $5 at the local, um, you know, home goods store. And just with some interesting light, what's interesting is I did this picture and then um, Nikon used it as a as behind when they launched the Z5, I think it was. Uh, they used it as a, as a background for that launch. This is a vegetable steamer reflected on some plexiglass. And there's that uh, martini strainer again. It's just fun to play with light and color and, and all of that. And really, the, again, I just want to, I know I'm going to probably make this point to death, but it's just a cocktail strainer. It's just, that's all it is. And it's you playing with, with light and your camera in such a way where you find photographs within, within something. The one thing I will say about, about macro photography for me, at least the way I do it, is, is that it's consuming. It's consuming in such a way where you feel as though like 15, 20 minutes turns into an hour, turns into two hours, turns into three hours. And the next thing you know, you know, the, the iterative process of working through the problems, trying to solve, like I've got a reflection where I don't want one. How do I solve that? It, it becomes consuming. And the next thing you know, three hours have passed and you've gotten to the photograph you really wanted to make. It's, you know, some people meditate, some people walk, some people hike, some people bike. For me, macro photography is very much that kind of thing in that, you know, you lose yourself in it. And the next thing you know, you miss dinner. This, by the way, is um, wrapping paper. Hey, Joey, uh, this is amazing work. You're, you're killing it. We've got, over, we've got over 500 people watching. Nice. Uh, I got a couple of quick questions I want to hit you with before you go too far in. Uh, Colin Smith is asking, what kind of oil did you use for the bubble macro shot? Um, I, I use different kinds of oil. It's a great question. 
Um, I use distilled water. Um, that's important. So there's, you know, no impurities in the water. And then I use, I use mineral oil. I've used olive oil. Um, I've tried other things that didn't work so well, but so far those two are, uh, the ones I have the most success with is oil, uh, uh, olive oil and mineral oil. Okay. Also, Colin Smith is asking, and uh, also Carolina as well, um, about uh, are you using gels for your colored backgrounds? And uh, what types of uh, light sources of colorful lighting are you actually using? Awesome questions. Truly awesome questions. Um, I use a number of different light sources. Um, I use for uh, speed lights, I use the Nikon SP5000 speed lights. Sometimes I need a lot more power because I, I designed these lighting, um, not to go too much on a deep dive into technical stuff, but I, in order to control light at a very small scale, um, I had to design these, these um, light fixtures that could narrow the beam down very small. And so in something like that, I need a lot of power. So in those cases, um, I use Profoto uh, D2 heads. Uh, sometimes I'll use some older acute heads as well. And then for continuous light, I use something called dado lights. Dado lights are focusable uh, LED lights. They're, they're wonderful, wonderful lights. And uh, um, I find them to be terrific if I need continuous lights. In terms of the color, I use gels. I have d uh, just a ton of gels. And so I try to find colors that complement one another. The other thing I do is I go to... Um, my local art store and they sell paper little 12 by 12 inch um, paper backgrounds and i have a whole collection of those and so sometimes um, i will just take one of those backgrounds and throw it in behind a subject and move it around and since you're shooting macro you're pretty close to things and so th uh, the background tends to be pretty far out of focus and so in that case you really don't see whatever pattern might be on the on the paper and so it just becomes this wash of color. So depending on what I'm trying to accomplish, um, I, I pull out one of those or I'll use a colored gel. Thanks so much, Joey. Appreciate it. Absolutely. So about a month ago, I was, um, I was traveling up in the central California area and I came upon an, uh, a, an art gallery and I found this beautiful glass bowl that was uh, light fascinates me as you can probably gather. And I just, I noticed it in the window and, and it was casting these beautiful shadows underneath the bowl. And I just said, I gotta have that. And I bought it like on the spot and I brought it back home and I real, and I was all set to take some pictures using the shadows, but I realized that, that actually the bowl itself was kind of fascinating. And I, I put a series of pictures in here just to make the point that you know, with one subject, you can kind of explore it and just keep going around and around and around and finding other pictures. This bowl is probably eight inches by eight inches. It's not very big and it's multicolored. But the point of it is, is just by using a macro lens and playing with angles and things like that, uh, you know, you can find all kinds of different photographs all within one subject. So four different pictures of the same bowl. Um, this is the inside of a, like a perforated aluminum base, the kind of thing that, you know, you'd stick some dried flowers in or something like that. And I thought it would look interesting if I just stuck the camera inside of it and then put colored lights inside and outside to try and, uh, you know, create some interest for it. But it's, you know, it's like the kind of thing that's like two bucks at some, uh, cost plus or something like that. I had fun um, a few years ago playing around with a rotating table, like a lazy Susan, uh, the kind of thing you would have on your dining room table to say, hey, pass me the salt. And they'd spin the thing in the middle of the table and you could get the salt. And what I did is I put, um, I put an LED panel on the top of the lazy Susan. And then I put little tiny colored uh, gels on the LED panel. So I, they were all different colors. And then by spinning it back and forth, at a slow shutter speed, I figured out around five seconds was about the right timing. And you just go back and forth, back and forth, and then open the shutter. If you hesitate, you get the dot. And so the idea, what I figured out was is if just by going back and forth, back and forth, and then hesitating at one end of it, you would end up with that dot. And it ends up looking like a, I don't know, looks like something I'd want to eat, frankly. 
Here's a different version of that uh, coffee filter. Again, something, you know, very simple, but, um, you know, you were asking about backgrounds. What you're looking at is the reflection of a background in the stainless steel coffee filter. Now, the challenge for something like this is that, you know, obviously you've got the rest of the coffee filter that you is not reflecting the background. So you've got to make sure that the viewer can see that as well. And that's where the challenge comes in is, is that you've got to light the top part, the part that's in the middle there, that's kind of black, and then light the background itself that reflects into the coffee filter. This is, um, I've gotten a lot of questions about this because it's very much the same as the glass that I showed you earlier. It's the same kind of light from 30 or 40 feet away to create these long shadows. These are my eyeglasses. But the, what I did is I added like a rose colored gel to the light that's lighting the glasses and casting the shadow. When you cast a shadow, obviously the shadow is dark. If you add a second light with a second color and you only turn the, the volume of the light up to the point where it fills the shadow and doesn't add anywhere else, you, add, you just fill the shadow with whatever, you're, whatever that light is. So in this case, I added kind of a turquoise colored gel to it. And by just turning the power up incrementally until I got enough, you end up with a, sh a shadow that's blue instead of um, that same, you know, like what, what would normally just be black or gray. I like, I love playing with um, abstract kinds of things. This is a mixing glass, which you would mix cocktails in. And so those lines in the middle are parallel to one another, but because of the camera angle and, you know, the, not only the lens itself, but the angle I'm approaching this glass from, they don't look parallel. And that's on purpose because I'm trying to kind of like manipulate your, or move you to go, what the heck's going on here? But the other part of it is, is the spout itself appears as though it's actually facing toward you, but it's actually facing away from you. We're shooting through the glass to the spout on the other side. And then by controlling the light in such a way that it doesn't light um, the near part of the, it, it's just deceiving. And so by using f-stop in such a way that you force the eye to look only at the part that's in focus, it's deceptive. But this kind of thing is the kind of thing you spend like three hours working on and you keep going and going and going until it is, you get what it is that you're looking for. A whiskey tasting glasses stacked together again, using uh, depth of field to uh, make the glass that's in the back sharp and the foreground stuff, they're all the same size, but you're forcing perspective and using f-stop to your advantage here. Now, this is the same whiskey tasting glass, but what I did is the glass in the front is pushed up against a piece of plexiglass. The glass in the back is behind the plexiglass and lit with a different color. And so what you're looking at is the glass in the front, but a shadow being cast by the glass in the back through the glass in the front, if that makes sense. And so these kinds of things are, again, they're, they're technically challenging, but they're insanely fun. This is a hose on a kitchen sink, uh, really just meant to show, this is what the new, uh, the new Nikon 105 for the Z camera. Um, I was tasked with uh, doing some pictures for the launch of that new lens, which um, I can tell you um, unequivocally, it's an amazing lens. And I, you know, I know that a lot of people talk about gear and they rave about things. Uh, uh, let me just say this. I've been using um, the F mount 105 for a really long time. And the most common question I get is, is, you know, is this lens just the Z mount version of that lens? And the answer is absolutely not. It's an entirely different lens. And if you have any doubt about the quality of this lens, I encourage you to try it. Um, you will be amazed. I, I was absolutely astonished with what they were able to do with this lens. It's absolutely incredible. So, you know, I'm not saying go buy it, you know, it'd be great if you did, but I'm, what I'm really saying is try it, see for yourself. If you're into this kind of thing, try this lens. Um, anyway, the point is, is um, it's, it's fun to just take something common like a sink hose and try and make pictures with it. This is, 
sitting up there. I don't know if you can see it, but it's it's actually one of my antique uh, light meters. And it's it's over 100 years old and you can see you can't see it up at the top, but it goes to like F364 or something like that. It's incredible. It's a really great, beautiful um, antique to have, which I have lots of and I'm fond of. Joe, you know, I admire your camera closet. There's some great stuff in there. Um, hey, I got a couple of quick questions for you before you move on. Certainly. Uh, uh, first off, uh, Andrew was asking about the lights that you were mentioning. I believe those were Dedo lights, the focusing lights, and yeah, made in France. Yes. You age cells, and they're great stuff. Yes. Um, uh, anything specific about the Dedo lights, or just talk a little bit more about them? You just want to know the name of those those lights. You know, that's yeah, they're Dedo lights. Um, they make they make a variety of different um, lights. They they're they're very well known in the in the movie business. Not all that well known in the still business. Um, what makes them unique is they're focusable, meaning they have a 20 to one focusing range. So you can do a really wide floodlight and then a very, very narrow beam. Um, they're, they're so controllable. And then they come in a bunch of different um, power, if you will, um, intensity. So I use, uh, they're, they're a little bit older. They make one now, it's called the D-LED 7. Um, I have the D-LED 4s. Uh, the D-LED 7 is wonderful, it's small. Um, and they're very, very controllable. That's what makes them great. I'm a guy who used to work in the lighting department at B&H. Dedo lights are just beautiful pieces of equipment, extremely well made. I, they're made in France, right? Uh, Germany, I believe it is. Okay. Okay, so uh, the other, this is a, a really good question, and the, uh, uh, Anonymous <laughs> is asking, what's a good intro level lens to get your feet wet with macro photography that Nikon offers? It's a it's an excellent question. I mean, the fact is, is you can really turn almost any lens into a macro lens and there's a variety of ways to do it. Um, the, the least intrusive way to do it um, in terms of financially is to just put a close up filter on the front of almost any lens and that'll just get you closer. Um, it's better with certain lenses. I prefer anything over a 50. I wouldn't do it with a wide angle lens. Um, the next way you can go is you can do, you can use extension tubes. The critical thing about using extension tubes is you have to make sure they link up with the body. Most modern cameras today don't have, um, are, they control the f-stop from the camera itself and not from the lens. So there's not an f-stop ring for you to turn. So if you de-link the lens from the body, there's no way to control the lens. So if you buy extension tubes, make sure they link up um, directly with the lens so that the camera can talk to the lens. Um, I'm not a fan of, of bellows simply because they're not that stable. They're good at, uh, you know, maybe up to two to one, but anything beyond that, you start getting, uh, to me, you get vibration and movement. I really prefer something more rigid. Um, so in terms of lenses, it depends on if you're using a DX or an FX body, they make a bunch of different lenses. Um, the one thing I always recommend to people is always assume you're going to, you're going to move to an FX body at some point. And, you know, if you don't know what FX is, it means a crop sent DX is a crop sensor. FX is a full frame sensor. So if you're on a D, if you're using a DX now buy an FX lens, because if you ever move to an FX body, it'll still work. If you buy a DX lens, then it won't work when you go to an FX body, except in the crop mode. So it's just, it's like a path forward. If you're positive, you're never gonna move to FX. They make a, um, an 85-35 that is a really excellent lens. I've used it, it's very, very good. But my, my preference in the, in the FX mount is the 105 VR. In the new Z mount, it's the brand new lens. And I, I will tell you, um, you're gonna have to give me a really good reason to not use that Z lens for everything going forward. I, I think my my F mount lens has has seen the last the last bit of work, frankly. Awesome! Thank you so much for those recommendations. And you know the cool part about a 105 macro is that if you need a a portrait lens as well, boom, you got one. It's like a double duty. The 105 is awesome. That's absolutely true. Good to move on. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about a couple techniques that I use that I think are, are fun and they're easy, frankly. 
um, you know, you can using modern technology, you know, you can you can sometimes turn a challenging subject into something truly amazing. Focus stacking or Nikon calls it focus shift shooting is a process of capturing a series of images all focused on a different part of a subject and then merging them together to create a single image that is precisely sharp anywhere you want precise focus. And I really want to make sure that, you know, you understand what 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 focus stacking really is. A lot of people ask, they'll say like, well, what's the difference between focus stacking and say stopping the lens down? It's very different from depth of field because in depth of field, depth of field will, will only give you a single point of precise focus. And then everything else is perceived focus. That's what you get with depth of field. Focus stacking, on the other hand, delivers actual focus everywhere. And so even the smallest f-stop on any lens would not deliver anywhere near the depth of focus obtainable with focus stacking. And you can see at the bottom of these, you know, some of these are at, at life size and it shows the number of captures. Some of the captures are, you know, it's a, it's a small number, some are big. And a lot of that has to do with how much depth did I want to keep, or how much of the of the subject did I want to keep in focus? The other thing is, is what kind of angle did I have going on toward the subject? That will often determine how many captures I need to make. I mean, this is just a simple flower, but it, it really ends up, at least in my opinion, it ends up looking like almost three-dimensional and otherworldly simply through focus stacking. You know, the lowly dandelion you grab out of your grass that you would consider a weed, you know, with some lighting and some focus stacking turns into something kind of cool. Now, what's happened technologically is it used to be that, you know, you had to use like a, a sled and you'd mount your camera on it and a computer would drive the sled and it would physically move the camera. What some camera companies have done, Nikon included, is they've put this into cameras themselves. So simply by setting something up in the menu system and saying, go, the camera will automatically, that's the key, automatically take a picture, refocus the lens, take another picture, refocus the lens, and so on for as many captures as you need. And then all you have to do is grab all those images, drop them into some software, and it'll build the stack for you. Something like this feather, which you can see is 200 captures. I'll, this feather is a lot smaller than it seems. It's probably the size of my pinky. And the point is, is you want to hold focus, you know, from near to far. And I'm at an angle as well, because I want that perspective to go along with it. You can see that the tip is pointed away from me or away from the camera. So in order to do that, I needed 200 captures to make it happen. This is something a lot closer. This is 10 times life size. Uh, it's a peacock feather, and it's relatively sat flat, so 48 captures will do it. This is made with the new Z lens. This only took 12 captures because we're really, you know, we're, 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 we're not on top of it. Something like this, like a succulent, um, focus stacking just makes something like this sing because every part of it is sharp. Whereas if you did this even at like F32 or F45, um, you wouldn't see anything like this. The other thing about focus stacking that's really critical is you can stop the focus anywhere you want. So like in this case, I wanted every part of that leaf to be perfectly sharp, but I didn't want the background to be sharp at all. I wanted that kind of out of focus, twinkly look in the background. So I just stacked it from the nearest point to the furthest point of the leaf and stopped. And that way I maintained the out of focus background. And that's the part that a lot of times isn't really understood about focus stacking. It's not the same as just simply stopping the lens down. And if you join us, and I hope you will on the 11th, um, I'm gonna go through and talk about um, all about how focus stacking is done. I mean, really describe it, not just looking at pictures, but step-by-step -step how it's done, how it works, giving you examples and things like that, along with some of the other um, techniques that I'm going through in this. But it's this kind of thing where, you know, you, you, you're basically stacking from 
one point to another point and no further, you really are, are able to control what the viewer looks at. It's really fun and it's really easy. I think a lot of people think it's complicated. I don't find it complicated at all. And particularly since, you know, when you're doing it internally with a camera, it just makes it, at, it's just it's literally press start and you can walk away from it. And when you hear the camera stop firing, you're done. Uh, butterfly wing. I mean, the, the textures and, and valleys and hills and everything else in a butterfly. I never get tired of looking at butterfly wings. I literally went out and grabbed this um, out of the grass one day during COVID, you know, looking for something to shoot. And I just pulled it out, turned it over and had some fun with it. This is a really good example of how, how stacking makes something look so different than how it would look if you shot it any other way. I mean, there's really no part of this feather that isn't tack sharp. And at 10X, uh, sorry, 5X, uh, this dragonfly wing really, really, really sings. So another thing that I love doing is going in even closer. Now this takes you kind of beyond um, the standard kind of lenses and things, and you're moving into, um, I use microscope objectives, they're microscope lenses for, for lack of a better word. And I use this tube very much like a gigantic extension tube but it allows me to get in really close on things and really see the details that the human eye can't see in any other way. I'm still using the same cameras. I'm just using a different way of magnifying the subject. So, you know, something like this, this is a, again, a butterfly wing magnified five times. You know, it really shows you the structures that hold the creature aloft, which is like I say, it's not something I could ever see with my, you know, with the human eye. And, you know, you see the patterns and textures and colors that are just would otherwise be hidden. So I want to just kind of give you an idea of the scale we're talking about. So this is a 105 macro. This is, you know, life size 73 captures to make this stack. And you need to stack something like this because the focus is so shallow that from the top of the rollerball pen, pen on the left um, to the dime, there's a difference in height that's enough that both could not be sharp. So you have to stack it. So what you're looking at here is it's a dime, it's a rollerball pen and a sewing needle, um, all photographed at life size. When you move in close and you get to five times life size, you know, suddenly you see the dings and scratches that the dime has acquired since 2012 when it was made. The rollerball now seems incredibly massive and the needle, you know, it, it doesn't look smooth anymore. You can see that it's got like this barbed metal surface. But when you move into 10 times life size, every object takes on like really a new appearance. All three subjects now appear massive. The dime seems like it'd be part of a, like, I don't know, like a medieval drawbridge or something. The rollerball looks like a battering ram and the needle I mean, it looks, it really looks like something barbaric, like a spear or something. It's, it's, you could never see this with your eye, but focus stacking allows you to see it. So this is, you know, life size at, at, uh, 78 captures again, a butterfly. The light here really helps us a lot because it, it brings out the textures and colors. And, you know, my friend Dave Black has this great saying, I quote this all the time because it's so brilliant. You know, he always says, if you want a subject to look interesting, only light, only light part of it. Well, in macro photography, one of the greatest challenges is since the frame is, is often only about 36 millimeters in width like that. I mean, you have to control the light in such a way where it doesn't go everywhere. And so that's a challenge. And that's frankly where a lot of the fun is. Now, when you get down to 5X, now you start to see, you know, the hind wing at five times life size and what that texture and that color really looks like. But if you look at the four wing at 10 times life size and you're careful with the light so that you have highlight and shadow, you really see what that, how that, that wing appears. Here's another butterfly at life size. Notice the fluffy tips that are at the, at the ends of the wing and the beautiful yellow patterns on the wing surface. So here are those fluffy tips. Now they don't look fluffy at all. They, they, they actually look dangerous. And you wouldn't see that unless you were at, at, at such a high magnification. 
When you get in really close to the surface of that yellow patch, this is what it looks like. And again, the light raking across the surface, it's all about control. And it's all about having fun with that control. Here's a spool of metallic sewing thread. It's about the width of your pinky finger. Get into five times life size though, and all of a sudden appears like, I don't know, party straws, wrapping paper, something like that. Certainly not sewing thread. And at 10X, I mean, it just gets crazy looking. It's like an abstract. Here's a peacock feather at life size. Now notice the delicate plumage at the very top of the feather. You can barely see that it's got some detail. And then at the bottom of the feather, not the bottom of the, of the stem part, but the bottom of the feather, there's like this converging Y shape, if you will. So here's that Y shape at five times life size. It's turned the other way, so it's a little disorienting, but um, a whole different kind of picture within the same subject. And here are those delicate feather tips at 10 times life size. One more butterfly. Notice the bushy tips up near the top of the frame, up on the left-hand corner, and the golden portion of the wing surface in the middle of the frame. So here are those bushy tips at five times life size. Again, turned for a better composition, but they actually look luxurious now. And then at 10 times life size, they look like ribbons or, um, I don't know, candy or something like that. They certainly don't look like they look at, at, at life size. Fascinating to me. So one of the things that I enjoy uh, probably more than anything is playing around with um, water droplets, oil and water, things like that. Um, I've been doing it for years and it's tons of fun. And it, it just seems to go together in a way that, I don't know, for me, it transcends depth and space. Um, I mix water and mineral oil, dish detergent, vinegar, uh, and then I add in glass to put it on. And then, uh, believe it or not, hypodermic needles play a role, pipettes and Petri dishes. I mean, in some ways it sounds more like chemistry than photography, but uh, cameras, lenses, and light fix fit right in. So this is um, cupcake cups, um, paper cups that you might get at a, at a grocery store. And I, I put this image in first because it really gives you an idea of how important the subject is in water droplet photography. You can see that what I've done here is I've taken the cups and I've, um, I've soaked them in water and then flattened them out and let them dry and then fanned them out in the background. And then the water droplets are magnifying those flattened cups, but the background color is the flattened cups. So the background plays a role in what the overall picture looks like. This is a kitchen sink mat, like a plastic mat you might put in the bottom of your kitchen sink. Uh, you can see it in the background back there, but when the water droplets magnify them, it creates this sphere that, you know, looks entirely different than the mat itself. And obviously, you know, you add in some colored light and you're careful with where the light goes and how it, um, creates shadows and textures and shape and form, and you get something like this. This is crazy looking, um, but it's also, it's bubble wrap. It's like what you might get um, in a shipment from B&H. And what I've done is it's water droplets, but I've defocused the lens. And crazy enough, this is what is in the defocused part of a water droplet with bubble wrap as a subject. Uh, the American flag, it's obviously upside down because um, a water droplet inverts what are, very much like a lens does, inverts what it is that you're, you know, you're photographing. This is something similar. This is a different kind of subject that's been defocused. And so you get these spiky, crazy, wild patterns. And obviously the background that's defocused as well um, creates those gigantic uh, circular forms behind it. Now, I hope that all my friends out there love coffee as much as I do. This is the bottom of a French press filter. Um, I look for things like this that are either transparent or have holes in them or, or um, you know, that, that have sh not so much shape, but has the ability where I can pass light through the subject 
but at the same time, light the background separately. It gives me the ability to do different things. So in this case, I've illuminated the, 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 um, the metal part of the filter, but also the background. So the, the color magenta is coming through the filter, the metal, the blue gel is hitting the filter, the metal part itself. And so you get two different colors. And then the only part that's in focus, of course, is what's in the water droplet. Here's another example of the cupcake baking cup, just kind of done a different way. You can see clearly if you don't fill the background with what it is you're shooting, you end up with a black uh, water droplet, but you can have fun with that. This is my friend, the kitchen whisk again. It's a little bit different. You know, the background is blue. The kitchen whisk was lit with, uh, you know, a warm tone kind of a, a gel and you get that kind of a result. This is a mini colander, like the like if you just had a handful of berries you wanted to rinse off, um, that's what this is. And what's what's interesting about it is the way that the colors are reversed. The blue in the water droplets are on the left, even though they're on the, I'm sorry, the blue of the water droplets are on the right, even though on the left are the actual water droplets. This is a juicer, the kind if you had a half an orange and you wanted to squeeze it, uh, that's what this is, kind of creates like an eyeball effect in it. Um, this is that mini colander again, just with a different kind of a background applied. This is, uh, you know, like when you put a rubber mat inside a kitchen drawer to keep stuff from sliding around, or maybe you might use it in the garage and tie it inside a tool chest so that the tools don't slide around every time you open and close the drawer. That's what this is. It's basically... Um, that surface and the top of it is illuminated that orange color and the background is illuminated the blue color. And so you end up with that kind of a pattern in the water droplet. These are simply colorful straws. So I had this idea, as I mentioned earlier, to cover an LED panel with colorful gels and then rotate the panel. Now, after messing around with it the first time, I went professional and I got a motorized thing that could continuously spin the thing around at a constant rate that I decided was perfect. And uh, the, the trick is you need one that um, is not plugged into anything because otherwise the cord will only go so far before obviously you run out of cord. So a battery operated one is really handy. But you know the result was a, the spinning behind the water droplets and you get a result like that. Now I tried it a couple different ways and every time you do it, you, you know, you get a different pattern and a different set of colors behind it. This is one of my favorites. Um, I'm a little closer to the water droplets here. So you can really see that, as I mentioned earlier, you know, that, that hesitation, if you will. So you get a dot with a streak tail behind it. Um, I kind of did the same thing here, only instead of rotating, I slid it. So think of something that moves back and forth diagonally. That's all that this is. It's that LED panel just being moved back and forth and you're, you're seeing the streaks in the background and the in-focus streaks in the water droplet. And again, same thing, just some different colors to, to do it. And then this, um, five bucks at my local Bed Bath & Beyond. It's, um, it's a sink, like a stainless steel drain cover. It's the kind of thing that you would put over the drain to make sure that your you know, engagement ring doesn't go down the drain uh, or anything else that's valuable to you. And the point is I go to that store and others like it all the time looking for stuff that I think is, you know, might be interesting. And you don't have to spend a lot of money. There's all kinds of things that are, I mean, to me, they're interesting. They make for interesting subjects and that's all this is. This is a uh, glass drying rack. And what I did is I was very careful to light the tips that the glasses would sit on with one color and then light the rest of the drying rack with a different color. And you end up with these spiky pointy things in the water droplets. This is another sink mat. I found this just about a month ago when I was working on the campaign for the new Z7 lens, um, or sorry, the new Z lens, the 105. And, uh, 
I, I did this one as a focus stack. So you're looking at about 35 images and I didn't do a good job of it, frankly. If you look at the water droplet in the, in the biggest one in the frame in the right-hand corner, you can see the top of it isn't quite sharp. And that's my fault for not really, really being careful to focus on the biggest, highest point of a water droplet. What I wanted to do is I wanted to focus on the highest point to the lowest point, but leave the background to stay as it was. I like the way the background looked. And if I just stopped the lens down, this wouldn't look anything like this. So this is kind of a combination of techniques. But again, it's a five or $6 plastic sink mat. And again, here are those trivets. Um, they're just pushed up against one another and then uh, illuminated, you know, raking light across the top of them to get this. Again, this is with the new 105Z lens. And I'm gonna end with these. Um, this is oil bubbles floating on water. And so this is similar to water droplets, but it's, it's different. Instead of putting the water droplets on glass, you're putting the oil on water. Um, what I found works is, you know, the smaller the container, the better. Obviously, you're very close. You don't need a lot of water and you don't need a lot of oil. But um, you can do this a lot of different ways. In this case, this is one of those cases of stirring the bubbles. In other words, like really um, exciting them, if you will. So you get a lot of them. And then, um, and then photographing them up close is a big, you know, filling the frame with bubbles. At the other end of the spectrum, though, is this where you have one big bubble and one very small bubble. And this feels more to me like outer space or something like that. But all it is, is um, one big oil bubble and one small. Now I say big, the biggest bubble is about the size of a dime, maybe, maybe a nickel. And the smallest one is obviously quite a bit smaller. Um, here's, you know, similar arrangement. For some reason, this reminds me of, of that movie Wally. -E. I don't know why, but I can't see anything else other than that. It reminds me of like a robot without arms. But the point is, is the background and the light and everything else plays an outsized role. This picture and this picture were taken moments apart. And all I really did is change the lighting and the background and a few other, you know, things. But I didn't move the camera or move the bubbles. By the way, they have a mind of their own. You can see, like, even within seconds, you lose... Um, a bubble or two. This is uh, oil bubbles, kind of like creeping up the glass, like a glass. So this is in a very tiny glass and you can see the edge of the glass. I shot this on purpose. So you see the reflection of the bubbles inside the glass. So you're kind of looking at an angle of the, of the glass up there at the top. And I don't know, for me, like I just like the idea of a few solitary bubbles floating in a sea of water. It just feels very peaceful. But again, the light plays an outsized role here. And finally, a collection of oil bubbles that to me, they appear almost three-dimensional with the addition of that most important of elements, light. So I just wanna, before I leave, I wanna, people always wanna know, you know, what you use to shoot it. The, these are the cameras I use, the Z7 II, the Z7, the D850 and the D5. The lenses I use for all my macro work um, are, are these four. They're, they're the main, other than the, the very high magnification stuff, these are the four lenses that I go to a lot. And I use the bottom two an awful lot. The, the tilt shift function of the perspective control lens um, gives me a lot of abilities that I don't have with any other lenses. And a lot of people don't realize those lenses are macro lenses. They're intended to be used as macro lenses and they're fantastic. And then for light, I often am using the SP5000 speed light controlled directly from the camera. Yeah, it's a great way to, um, you know, to not have to walk around and play with the lights. You can just do it right from the camera itself. And with that, I will say thank you. And I do want to say, you know, I want to thank B and H and Nikon. Really, they really consistently support photographers. Um, I have been a B and H customer for longer than I, I care to admit. But I, I will tell you that um, they have helped me out in so many situations. And, you know, I really I want to thank them. You guys give us the tools that, you know, make pictures possible. So thank you. And uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Dave. Thank you so much, Joey. Uh, I got a couple of uh, questions in here for you, but I appreciate what you said about B&H Photo. I just going to say one thing. I'm you know, working at B&H for a long time. 
we really we enjoy our work when a, a photographer comes to us they want to achieve something and they just don't know how to do it that's like the best customers we kind of work them through and figure it out with them and problem solve and get them the right equipment to get the job done right we appreciate that okay um, that was an amazing presentation also joey by the way you broke a record for optic we've been doing webinars uh leading up to our our seminars now since we've gone virtual due to covid you broke a record we had over 600 views at one time so, that's nice um, thank you amazing well done sir just goes to speak for your work and thank your, you uh, and your abilities and everything so i got a couple quick questions from you um first off one of our friends uh just wants to uh say hello and i'm sure we uh um, we know Jeffrey Falk. Uh, he's a, a great uh, guy who works with a lot of focus stacking stuff. And a lot of people were asking, what's the software for focus stacking that you're using? Well, I, I, I will tell you, but I'm going to go into detail about that in the main stage presentation. But um, there are basically three ways you can do it. You can do it in Photoshop, but it's insanely hard. The other two are um, Zareen Stacker. It's made by Zareen Systems. I find that to be amazingly useful um, the other one is made by a company called Helicon Soft. Um, uh, I forget, I actually forget the name of the software. It's, um, um, but that's the company, Helicon Soft. Both of them are terrific. Okay, perfect. You just covered a couple of, um, you know, I think really uh, take those recommendations. Um, we, we've got them, Helicon Focus, we've got them in our, our chat yes. link. So that's a good one. And I think there's a bunch of them out there. I mean, someone was asking about Pixel Shift. Um, I, you know, th those are, those are the ones that you endorse, the ones that you mentioned, and, and you're going to go into more detail on July 11th on that. Yes. Okay. That's going to be great. Um, so let me just go over a couple more in here. Um, you know, uh, Kim, uh, uh Kowalowski is asking about showing us the camera and light setup. Uh, I think again, on, on July 3rd, your main stage presentation will cover you, uh, working on that. So we'll do that. Um, this is a big question and I, 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 Ronald Johnson asked and a few other people, what's your preferred f-stop to shoot at? Um, I am, I'm, I'm kind of a stickler for testing all my lenses and making sure I know what, what, how, what f-stop a lens performs best at. And so the answer to that question is it depends on the lens. I know all my lenses, which one is sharp at what f-stop. So when I'm doing focus stacking, it's another advantage to focus stacking is, is that you can stack at the optimum f-stop for your lens. If you're stopped down to f32 or something, that lens is not gonna perform its best. No lens does. And so um, for me, it tends to be somewhere between five, six and 11, but um, I test every lens to be sure I know for sure. Like that, that middle range in general. Yes. So that leads me to a question then. Why were the F64s called F64s? Because they like to shoot at F64. <laughs> <laughs> Dif different rules for, I guess, Lorx format or? Apps, yeah. Okay. okay. Why um, does a meter go to F364? <laughs> <laughs> Inquiring minds want to know. Yes. <laughs> Are you putting the water droplets on pieces of plexiglass? And I told one person you could buy plexi at the, the local hardware store. Um, I mean, sourcing things like that, but what are using plexi and water droplets? I use, I use something called Starfire glass. It, what it is, is it's, um, I refer to it as the most optical glass you can, you can acquire, at least that I know about. What Starfire glass is, and that's a brand name. What it is, is it's low iron. Typically, when you look at window glass, it's got a lot of green in it. Starfire doesn't have iron in it, so it doesn't have that green appearance. And so you pay about three times as much for it. But rather than having to contend with that green tint in all my photographs, I'd rather go with the... And you don't need that much of it, frankly. You need an area maybe 12 inches by 12 inches because you're not shooting in an area much bigger than that. Thank you, son. That's a great tip. I never, I never heard of that before. Victoria Folk asked that question. I think you really nailed it. Um, Sharon is asking if you're using extension tubes to get 5x and 10x. I am. I'm using. It's not extension tubes. It's a tube system essentially. Um, it's it's a little too complicated to 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 describe right now. But it is a tube. On one end is the is the camera, and on the other end is a microscope objective. And it's about 16 inches long. 
Wow. But it's got, it's complicated. It's got a lens in the middle of it. And, um, but it's, it's, uh, it, it, if you want to know more about it, um, reach out to me. I'm, I'm happy to answer that. You know, a couple of people were asking about where you got some of these items to photograph, in particular, the butterfly wings. And I, I took the liberty of just pointing them to the, uh, the evolution store in New York City. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can, I guess you source your, your insects like that. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple of um, there's a couple of online places um, uh, that that you can get butterflies and insects and things like that. Obviously, if you're doing stack complicated stacks, they can't move, so they have to be what are commonly referred to as specimens. Go ahead. There's a, I remember in LA, I, I stumbled upon an amazing uh, store that had uh, skulls, uh, specimens, all sorts of fossils. Yeah. Um, it was like, I think it wasn't downtown. I'm not too sure where it was here. But if you, if you just Google, you know, butterfly specimens or insect specimens, there's a bunch of them online. Um, I use one company called Big Bugs and another one called the Butterfly Company. And I use it for feathers. I get them from a place called Moonlight Feather, um, which is interesting. They sell primarily to like dancers in Las Vegas. So you have to root around a little, true story. You got to root around a little, but you'll find, I mean, you find all kinds of great things there. Um, amazing. Um, oh, you know what? Um, uh, Ch uh, Chilika Cyan, uh, good point. Um, why does the meter go that high for our, our uh, is for pinhole photography. Interesting. Interesting. What's funny is on the, I mean, we could spend hours about this, but what's funny on the back is it gives, it gives suggestions. So like for boats on the sea, set it here for. <laughs> right. <laughs> Vintage instructions. Um, okay. So I, I think we got most of the questions. Some of uh, everybody's questions uh, were, were fairly general and really did cover it. The one thing I'd have to say, Joey, and this is going to be everybody's lesson for watching your presentation. I'll be coming up. Um, absolutely. Have note paper handy because you are dropping nuggets of wisdom left and right and uh, really bringing up some amazing uh, discussions about equipment sourcing and really uh, just photography in general. So it's been an honor and a pleasure having you here on today's Thank webinar. You. Really looking forward to seeing you on the uh, 11th, July 11th for the big presentation on the main stage. And I uh, want to double down and say thank you, Nikon, for for providing you. And it's also been great, Joey, to be living in your in your droplet world during this presentation. Thank you, David, very much. And thank you, everybody, for, for hanging out. I know people have things to do, and I appreciate you spending an hour with us. Thank you so much. And one more thing also, this has been recorded. So if you want to watch it, check back on the website. You'll just be able to click on Watch This and pop up this amazing video again if you missed anything. Thank you once again. Joey, All right. have a good day. Thank you.